Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join T2 and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Martin Johnson, and I've got a very special guest today who I'm incredibly proud to have on the podcast. Without question, probably one of the greatest leaders I've ever served under and worked for. Um, it's Richard Farrington, CBE. Welcome to the podcast, Richard. Oh, good morning, Johnson. Uh, it's nice to be here, young man. How are you? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's really, really good to hear you, sir. And, and again, we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna fall into that. I'm gonna try and call you Richard throughout, but Me I've been too. that. Yeah, I've had uh, it. I, I, so to give the listeners an idea of what we're talking around, and that little exchange there gives you an an, in, an insight into our past. From good morning, Johnson, to good morning, sir, is uh, <laughs> Richard. Farrington CBE, uh, a illustrious, illustrious career. Um, and if I work backwards, just to some of the notable uh, roles you had serving in the Royal Navy, you were commander of Devonport Flotilla. You were the captain of surface ships Portsmouth Flotilla. You were captain of the UK Amphibious Forces. And most no, uh, well, what's certainly um, you know familiar to me is you was the commanding officer and captain of HMS Nottingham which I served on at the same time, I think between 2000 and 2003. Um, it was a wonderful time, most fantastic time of my naval career. Um, we uh, had some great times. We had some challenging times on the Nottingham, most famously when we crashed into the Wolf Rock uh, in the Tasman Sea. Um, and what turned into a fantastic story of teamwork and, and courage and, and, and success um, and I always remember you fondly, Richard, as I, I meant what I said, one of the best leaders I've, I've worked under and served under. And we fell out of touch for a while, didn't we? And then all of a sudden, through the wonderful world of social media, we seemed to connect again and we exchanged some messages and we was it was instantly like we'd gone back 20 years and we was back on the Nottingham. So we agreed to do this podcast, talk about all things leadership, teamship. Uh, all of that great stuff. So thank you for your time, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Have I have I missed anything out in that intro, Richard, or will that do? No, I think well, I think the only thing you've missed, Martin, is your extraordinary uh, uh, evolution since those days as a young able seaman in that ship, uh, and to see you now, uh, you know, uh, running this company and uh, and and doing all this all, all this, you know, leadership and uh, and, um, and and mentoring and coaching and stuff. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And it just shows, to my mind, um, that institutions like the Navy can give people the most extraordinary step up, um, and uh, and it produces really remarkable individuals. So it's such a pleasure to be back in touch with you after, yeah, too long. Are you going to the reunion? Well, do you know what? I think I'm going to now. I've seen a few you're of them. You're going to have to, otherwise you're, I'm going to put you down on a charge for being a <laughs> Yeah, well, listen, sir, that means if, if that's an order, a direct order, I'll, I'll be going. An, I think you should take that as an <laughs> Ab- Absolutely. So uh, when it, just remind me, which when is it, Richard? Because I've seen a few of them. I know. Uh, for, uh, 7th of May. 7th of May in, in, in the great city of Liverpool. Um, and men. again, w- what an extraordinary event, because we've had this uh, little team of people. So the ship had sort of 250-odd sailors on board. And throughout the last 20 years, um, there's been this wonderful network on uh, social media organised by one of the young sailors, not by, not by an officer, not by a, not by a, not, not by a sort of a major uh, figure on board, a, 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 a dedicated, passionate uh, a sailor who loved his time on that ship, Alan Murrell. And he's pulled this whole thing together and there's a load of people turning up and um, it's not the first one we've had, but 20th anniversary is quite important, I guess. So, um, but brilliant. And well, all these people who have all gone on to do fascinating things, some of them still in the Navy. Um, the vast majority moved on and, uh, and and are contributing to society in 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 some other way. What a what a brilliant thing! Can't wait. Oh, brilliant! I, I will look in my diary immediately after this, and I will make all effort. I promise you that. And I think Al Morel, God, yeah, I remember him. Um, and and I've seen a couple of the stuff because I'm a member of the group on 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 social media, and it's just fascinating. I didn't I didn't actually connect until now that it was 20 years ago. 20 years anniversary so yeah let, let me make all the effort to do that and 
it'd be fantastic to see you in person as well. So, um, okay, we can talk for hours today, Richard, without a shadow of a doubt. We've got a lot to talk about, but um, let me let me go back before we talk a little bit about leadership and about teamwork and about uh, some of the work you've been doing since your naval career with sailing and uh, and team building and stuff like that is, you know, uh, if you rewind 20 years to to that trip we had to the Far East on HMS Nottingham and to the incident with Wolf Rock where we grounded and uh, and had a very serious situation which we managed to triumph from. Um, does it seem like yesterday? Does it, uh, does it seem a long time ago? And um, how, what's your thoughts when you look back on, on, on it now, 20 years on? Well, it's one of those things that you can't really... Um, it, was, it was a life-changing experience for all of us in some way. Uh, and so uh, because we effectively went from, you know, peacetime cruising to uh, wartime survival in a, in, a, in a matter of a few minutes. So inevitably the sort of... Um, emotional uh, element of it um, you, you can't just put that in a box and, and, and throw it away well you can I suppose you could but it, it, it came to shape all our lives in some way so and I've tried to look at it as a, as a positive experience so yeah I still I can still relive it quite easily um, over the years I gave quite a lot of talks about it because it was such an interesting example of, of that whole business of, of that, that instant transformation from normal to incredibly abnormal. When you go to war, you normally have time to prepare and, uh, and you, you make a you know, your politicians make a decision, uh, your military leaders then do some planning. Uh, you do some training, and off you go. So by the time you arrive at that war, um, you're quite well prepared. And even today, and if we look at the uh, ghastly situation in Ukraine, it's quite clear that the Ukrainians thought there was a reasonable chance that they might be invaded. And so they were, you know, unsurprisingly, they were quite well prepared. Um, within the limitations of, of whatever equipment and manpower they might have had. It didn't happen overnight. What happened to us on that day uh, back in um, July 2002 happened instantly. And so the way people react and reacted at the time is bound to be slightly different as a result. Uh, but at the same time, Martin, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, well, I hope you would. There was quite a bit of preparation for that. We weren't, we knew what to do, surprisingly. We all, you know, we had roles. We, we, we practiced um, damage control. We practiced. We'd never, we'd never, we hadn't done it. Not many of us had done it for real. We had one, uh, some guys on there who'd been in, in, the, in the Falklands campaign and um, a good friend of ours, Terry Lendrum, um, was was in Coventry when uh, when she sank. So there was there were some there were guys around with some real practical experience, but people like you and I had just done the training. Well, we it's in the training, didn't we? We you know we would have we would have damage control exercises quite regularly. And one of the things I remember was during the course of that long night, a young lad saying, "Course, so this is just like the training, isn't it? Except that." In the training, the uh, serial ended at four o'clock and we all went for tea. <laughs> uh, and this is still going on. When, when do you think it will end? <laughs> well, I don't know, mate. <laughs> yeah. When we get rid of the water. <laughs> um, so a fascinating sort of – so, yeah, does it stick with you? Yes. Uh, do you put it in a box? Mm, sort of. But I draw on it, Martin. I draw on it. Um and I found it to be a very interesting sort of case study in 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 leadership, management, teamwork, communications, all those sorts of core skills that that actually people need all over the place. Yeah, and and yeah, as you're talking there, Richard, I I connect with one thing. I talk a lot in the work we do with our organizations and clients around uh, the power of repetition is the, is the way to, to become very competent at something. And I remember that trip, right? For the first four months of that trip, three months of that trip, 
I'm part of the damage control and fire control party. So we're doing endless exercises, if you remember, every day at sea for exercise, for exercise, for exercise. And I'm having to don my gear, run to the place of, of incident, pretend to be in this situation. And I've got to admit, you know, at times, certainly if you've been on a run ashore the night before, you don't <laughs> want to do it, right? You just yeah, don't want to do yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, and and I remember I was barely 19 years old on that on that deployment. And um, I remember when we when we grounded and we hit the rock and I was actually sat in three echo mess. I, I, I was part of three echo mess. So I was just come off watch mm. in, in my over, overalls with another uh, playing on the PlayStation. I think we was playing FIFA or something. So I was directly above where we hit. Mm. So it literally threw us from our seats. The noise was horrendous. The sparks, the smoke, the, the water was instant. Mm. Mm. And without thinking, without thinking, due to that repetition that we'd put in every single day for months on end, I literally stood up, put my steaming bats on, I ran up the ladder, I ran straight to the uh, to the galley uh, or the dining hall, I think it was where we met, mm. and I and I was ready to rock without mm. even thinking. And mm. and mm. when I was then deployed to an area for damage control, it was it was second nature. There was no panic. There was no second guessing yourself. That you didn't have to look for kit. You didn't. You just knew exactly what you was doing, and it just clicked in. And I think to your point. That is through the power of repetition, and that's what the Navy, particularly the military, does. Military training drills in skills and competencies through the power of repetition. And I'm not so sure in civil street and in workplaces that we get the same level of repetition in on the stuff well, that we need to do. Well, no, but it's, there's a couple of there's a couple of really interesting points that you bring out there. The first is, um, and uh, you talked about doing all those training drills. If I remember correctly, I think you were one of the. You were quite often a firefighter, dressed in um, in um, fear naught suits and things. Yes, you're a big lad, weren't you? Yes, you still are, but you know you were a strong lad, and so you were you. So your job was quite often in those in those drills as part of the standing sea emergency party was to be a firefighter, but this wasn't a fire. This was a flood. I mean, there were fires. There was, you know, water and electricity don't mix. You get fire, but it was a f it was a flood basically. So, so that's the first thing is immediately you were not doing what you would do, and you might not have been on watch as the standing sea emergency party. You, you know, you, so you would go as a, as a as a as a as an extra to be deployed wherever is required, and that's why you went to the dining hall. The second thing is. You knew your way around that ship pretty well because you'd been there quite a lot. So you became very familiar with the way it worked and how it was laid out. You weren't necessarily an expert in, in any of the individual pieces of equipment. You were an expert in, 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 in your particular field. Uh, but so, you know, and a ship, you know, a ship is like a, I often think of it as being a bit like a piece of theatre. Um, there's all kinds of people required to put on a, uh, a, a play at a theatre. There's actors, there's lighting people, there's makeup artists, there's, there's the chap who, uh, writes the, who makes the programme, there's the chap who sweeps the, you know, who sells the ice cream at the interval. They're all part of making that, piece of theatre come to life when you as the audience go and sit there and you're transported well a ship's the same you know there's chefs there's engineers there's gunners there's people who steer it there's navigators there's you know there's all those various roles and we've all got a pretty good idea what everybody else does and in a theatre you need the lights to go on at the right time. You need the actor to step out and say his lines at the right time. You need the stage, the set, not to fall down. All those things need to happen. They all rely on each other. And as a result, you have this piece of magic for an hour and a half when you go to the theatre. Well, the ship works the same way. So in that case, there you were, Martin, and you got out, got out of your mess deck at sort of 10 o'clock at night. It was three minutes past 10, for those who are counting. And, uh, and off you went. Uh, and you knew the people around you. You knew what their roles were. You knew what your, you thought you probably knew what your role was going to be. 
But I remember you. we put you into the after-engine room. Yes, you did. Yeah, that's right. Not, not your comfort zone. You were a, you were a gunner, weren't you? Or, or yeah, a, yeah, you were a yeah. So you'd have been on the upper deck with, with uh, you know, small caliber weapons or, or, or something like that. So putting you in the after engine room was immediately sort of out of your comfort zone, except that you might have been in there on an exercise. You might have been in there uh, for a familiar, you'd have certainly been in there for familiarization. You'd have certainly roughly known your way around, um, but it wasn't your place of work. We asked you to go in there, and I remember you went in there with um, with Guy Ritchie, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, that's correct. And um, who was leading hand? So he was your boss, and um, and you're both gunners. So you, there you were in the in the in the you know in, in Dante's Inferno in the engine room, um, shoring up a bulkhead to stop water coming through from the other side. I don't know. If, did you know how much water there was on the other side of that bulkhead? <laughs> No, I didn't, and so That's I think as well. <clears throat> well, uh, you the compartment next door to it was full, yeah, and the bulkhead was not designed to keep water in; it was designed to keep water out. So you were on the wrong side of a potentially um, a, a rather unpleasant situation. Well, I don't know if you remember this, Richard, but the next day, once we'd stabilised the ship and. Mm we were having to sort of deal with the fallout and the media and the aftermath. Uh, you got you got a group of us, uh, I think, on the upper deck, on the flight deck, um, just to say a few nice words of, of, you know, praise from the efforts of the night before. And you said to me and Guy Ritchie, leading Seaman Ritchie, you said, guys, did you know how much, when I put you down in that compartment, do you know how much water was in the compartment behind the wall, behind the bulkhead? And we said, no. And you said, it was at the top. Yeah, it was. And, and you said to us, uh, I, I, if that bulkhead of give way, uh, it, it, you two, you, you, we'd have lost it and, we'd, and who knows what would have happened to you two. You, but you said to us, with a little bit of a, a typical bit of humour that you had, you said to us, but I didn't want to tell you at the time because uh, you seemed like you was having a jolly good time down there. <laughs> and it was like, it was almost like you could see the seriousness, but we were blissfully unaware, you know, on the other side yeah, of the bulkhead. Um, that was a, yeah. That's a very interesting thing from a sort of from a leadership perspective isn't it is uh you know we over time you became aware of just how serious the situation was now the guy making the first decision probably me i suppose um and making all those decisions how much information do you need to make a decision do you know what I mean? It's quite an interesting mm. sort of issue. And how much information do you share about that? Because, well, well, one of the problems we had was that internal communications failed because the water got into all the internal communication systems. So, so actually providing that information to you wasn't that easy. But... But I, but I remember walking, I went all, you know, over the course of the, that, that night, you know, I was in every compartment talking to people. And gradually, everybody came, became aware of just how serious the situation was. And you would have become aware that um, the bulkhead you were shoring up was absolutely critical to the um, survival of the ship. Um, although you probably didn't realise it at the time, but you must have thought, why are they sent me down the after engine room when the uh, when the when the damage is up the front? Um, well, it was, good, it was there was a good reason for that, obviously. But um, but you so there was a there was a fascinating sort of piece for you as a as a young lad and leading Seaman Ritchie, who was your the two of you. He was the, the man in charge, if you like. Um, with a bit more experience, and and, uh, and and you know, and between the two of you, you did a cracking job, but you didn't quite know the scale of what was going on. You must have, you must have dawned on you. When did it dawn on you? It dawned on me. Uh, I, I'll remember this significantly. It dawned on me when we'd done. I think we'd done about ten hours straight of damage control um, through the night, and. When we stabilised somewhat and got the pumps uh, to start chucking more water out than we were we were taking in, I went to the upper deck the next morning oh, yeah. and I and I went to the front of the ship yeah. and I saw and I saw the list and the front yeah. bow 
was probably no oh, more than eight eight feet above the water level. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? You walked up, you always walked up onto the bow of the ship, and 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 I remember that at dawn walking up there, and you walked down to the bow. And I remember thinking, you could, did you look over the bow, and and you could see the bloody thing peeled back like an orange. Oh, uh, I remember thinking to myself. I looked over the side, and I remember thinking we were literally seven or eight feet away from sinking. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Oh, well, um, well, we got closer than that. Yeah. Uh, and that was the moment it dawned on me. But that was right. ten hours. Okay. Ten, ten. That was ten, ten hours, hours after. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So, but, you just, were, but, but your commute. But when you were in sitting in that compartment, um, you know, and you and your job was basically to um, because the the the, uh, the bulkhead was was. Um, had it's probably started life as, as a watertight bulkhead, but over time, you know, um, modifications, or, you know, um, hatches were put in it, you know, uh, holes were cut in it for various bits and pieces. So we had to, you had to put wooden shoring in. And I remember you, you, you had, we asked you, we told you to put bedding in there too. Uh, yeah, well, the, well, the reason we did that was because... You guys got bedding from your own bloody um, mess deck. I'd have gone to somebody else's mess deck. <laughs> <laughs> well i remember we were shoring up the big parts with the wooden um you know with the with the wood yeah uh with the wedges but there were certain elements of the bulkhead that was so tiny in in like a in scale yeah. like you couldn't get the wood in so yeah. the only way we could do it was to we I can't remember what we used we used like a thin metal device and we was hammering the bedding into these short into these smaller places so yeah. it would literally stop the water spraying across yeah and bedding and it was the only way we could do that and at the yeah. time we've never ever been trained to use bedding on no, damage control but you know yeah. it was the only thing we could get in there I know. And, and yeah so, it was... so despite all that training people were still innovating heavily but i would say you were drawing on your experience and common sense and all those other sort of life skills that um, that that you that you guys had accrued over you know your short twenty years of, of life. This guy was a bit older than you. Uh, I suppose he was what late twenties, probably. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, but you know, you were you were young. You were relatively young guys, um, and uh, and there were some obviously some more experienced people like me around. Um, uh, but people were having, as you, pe people were doing things that they'd not done before, um, because it was, we'll give it a go. It it, it might work. Um, yeah. You know, what's the word? Well I, well, I also think Richard, there was an element of there is no option. We're in the middle of the Tasman Sea, yeah, 500, yeah. 500 miles from anywhere. The yeah. sea state is rough. Yeah. It's the middle of the night and pitch black. Yeah, no, we we coming to help. Yeah, we, we, no one's coming to help. We have no option but to keep yeah. the ship afloat. And it's I think true. that was that was the mentality. It was it but, was. But, but you didn't. I mean, I, I, and people like I was aware um, uh, that um, we uh, we knew from the stability um, calculations and all the training that that, that I'd done um, prior to taking command that. If you lose two engine rooms, you lose. There's a pretty good chance you lose the ship. Um, so we knew the, the stakes were high, uh, and we knew that there was more water coming in than we were able to get out. Uh, and we knew that we were sort of, you know, if we, you know, things like, um, you know, the fireman pressure and you know, our ability to pump d depended on, you know machinery running and of course as that machinery submerged some of it stopped running so we were aware that um time was against us and we knew that we had to as you say you, you, there wasn't an option of getting off that was quite an interesting thing in itself about about a year later some um scientists from some military ministry of defense research establishment came to see me and they said we uh, we're very interested in what happened to you guys and um we think we need need to design ships to make to make it easier to to uh, to escape from them. Uh, and I just screamed with laughter and said, "You've got it all wrong. We're not interested in escaping. That's our home. Where were we going to escape to? <laughs> in the middle of the Tasman Sea at midnight, in a in a gale. You know, we were not going. That was our that was our best chance of survival was to keep that bloody thing afloat. So please put all your efforts." into um, 
uh, making it easier for us to keep our ships afloat rather than trying to escape from them. The very last thing I wanted to do. And then they said to me, well, did anybody not? Did anybody, you had 250 people, did anybody not um, participate in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, uh, in the response? Um, absolutely 100%. Everybody threw their heart and soul into that activity. And not least because, you know, depending on how long it, you know, where they were in the command chain as to how quickly they learned as to how grim everything was, they knew that this was it. This was the, this is what they had to do. Uh, it, there was just no, 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 no concept that anybody would not have, would say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, can I get off, please? Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. You know. Just doesn't life doesn't work that way. Yeah, can I ask you a question, Richard? Because I, I want to come into 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 the leadership piece as well in a minute. In a minute, but my last question on this is: um, Did you at all uh, in during that that evening, that whole evening through the night, the incident? Did you come remotely close to abandon ship to a call on abandon ship? Um, that's a really difficult question. Actually, um, there was a just after we were when I got to the bridge because I not I wasn't on board uh, beforehand and and it, I, I climbed on board uh, with the helicopter and and before I <coughs> before I got back to the back up to the bridge the ship had run aground. By the time I got to the bridge, then I had to work out what to do quite quickly. Um, so my instant decision was to get her off the rock. Uh, and just so, sorry, Richard, just to loop into that, because I I do tell a little story of you in some of my leadership lessons. Right. So I hope you don't mind. And if it's slightly in, if it's slightly inaccurate, don't just go along with me, because don't let the truth get in the way of a great story. Right. But I I vaguely remember replaying and just in the aftermath and the story that, you know, you, you, you got onto the bridge after the incident. There was alarms going off because all of the water's coming in. So all the alarms are going off on the bridge. It's noisy as hell. People are panicking, running around, having conversations, looking at maps. Decide, you know, it's all a bit chaotic when you first arrive on the bridge. And I think your first subconscious decision, uh, although it wasn't a decision at all, is to try and calm yeah. the okay. noise. It was like, put yeah. block block the alarms turn yeah. them off yeah everybody be quiet let me yeah. think and and, I, and the leadership lesson I, yeah. I say in that richard is great leaders in a crisis at first do nothing they simply think yeah. around yeah. Do, uh, what yeah. what do i need to do and your first initial thought yeah. you've always said was yeah. we need to get off this rock is that yeah. is that correct am i correct not in saying far that? Off. yeah not far off instant it, it, the there was a there's a there's a, a very slight adjustment to that when i got to the Bridge. I got there just before the alarm started going off because it took some. It took while for the water to sort of penetrate to those areas where the where where, where it set the alarms off. So my arrival on the bridge sort of coincided with this with bedlam starting. So that was a that was a sort of after a sort of sort of slightly ironic moment that my my arrival started. To, it wasn't it wasn't entirely my fault. The bedlam, um, it was purely water getting into uh, into systems that didn't that weren't designed to have water in them. But yes, getting rid of the noise, uh, getting rid of the distraction, very important. Focusing on the what needed to be done, very important. But I could not wait for a full assessment of the damage. I had to make a quick call because I knew, I knew that the tide was dropping. And so I knew that the longer we stayed on the rock, the more difficult it would be to get off it. And I felt instantly that if, uh, I just knew from my experience that if we stayed on there, there was a good chance the ship would break her back on there and then we would all end up swimming anyway. So, so the interesting thing here, Martin, is about, you know, how much information do you need to make a decision, a, a strategic decision? Because getting off that rock was a, 
if you like, in 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 a in a, in a business case, that was a pretty important strategic decision. But I made it. And then the next thing that happened, well, uh, we can talk about getting off because that was quite interesting in itself. And getting off caused a bit of more damage. And that's why you ended up in the after engine room. Because one of the th- when we came off, we broke off a stabilizer, which was in the forward engine room. And this stabilizer, like a big rudder thing, and, and it made a big hole in the forward engine, which is where all the water came in. So the, the, that, that, the damage in the forward engine room was secondary. Right. Caused by coming off the rock. But we had to come off. As soon as we came off, the ship started to to list. In fact, I thought it was going to roll over. And that, you asked me, did I ever think about abandoning ship? As I stood on the bridge wing and came clear of the rock and she started to roll over, I had a, a very dark moment where I thought, I've got this wrong. We're going to roll over. All my boys, how am I going to get them out? Where am I going to jump to? Where's where's my life jacket? Hmm. Where am I going? To, shit, have I got this wrong? That was the that was the only moment when I seriously thought, and it lasted. I don't know how long it lasted. It didn't last more than a few seconds, but it felt like an hour, and. And I remember walking back into the bridge and by then it was stony silent and they were all staring at me. And that was interesting. Wow. You know, what we're going to do now, sir? Oh, Christ. You know, that, uh, I've, I've spoken about this bef- a little bit before. That's the loneliness of command. All those people staring at me and me just thinking, having just got a grip of myself thinking that the thing was going to roll over and I was going to have to go swimming and my boys were going to drown. Um, and then she, st- she, st- she went over to about 10 or 15 degrees, which doesn't sound a lot, but I can assure you it's a long way. Um, uh, and it feels pretty scary. Um, but she didn't go any further. She stopped at that. Um, and, and so when I came back in, I was thought, right, okay, well, we've got to get ourselves. A, what I was planning to do actually was to run her aground, but on a beach of my choosing rather than a rock that just happened to be in the way. Because I thought if I put her on a beach, then she won't sink. Do you see what I mean? Mm. You know, she'll just sit there. If she fills with water, well, we can stand on the top. But around the rock, the water was deep. And I knew that if we, uh, if we sank near the rock, then we would sink. So I needed to get to shallow water. So that was my sort of, so I, no, abandoning ship, I didn't want to do. Uh, and there were two reasons for that. First of all, as a sailor, your ship is your home. Uh, and secondly, there was a, an enormous sort of personal investment in that ship. It was, that was my life. You know, I'd spent hmm, 22 years in the Navy by that stage. All I'd ever wanted to do was drive a destroyer. Ever since I was a little boy, it's all I'd ever wanted to do, really. And there I was doing it. And now, now we had a thing with a hole in it. So the thought of it sinking would have just, oh, I don't know what it would have done to me, let alone if anybody, if I'd lost anybody. Do you see what I mean? So all yeah. those things said, don't, said it, don't let it sink, don't let it sink. Uh, so don't do you, abandon it, don't abandon it. You know, uh, there was just no, it was just, it's an extraordinary thing, Martin. It's quite a difficult thing to to compare to to civilian life, where there aren't many uh, decisions that you make which have such profound consequences. Do you know what I mean? I think there must be because you know people people wind up companies. People, you know, can you you know whether it's you know. People lose their jobs. People, uh, you know, um, dreadful things happen. Um, but usually they happen over a period of time. And you have time to think about them and you have time to try to um, to to avert disaster. But disaster does come. There's not much you can do about it. But, um, so, so just replaying a couple of things there, Richard. Fascinating, by the way. I'm living. I'm reliving this with you as as we speak. Mm-hmm. But um, 
I, I think a couple of things I picked out from that was how much information do you need to make a decision? And sometimes you can't wait for all the information. Oh, you know, sometimes yeah. it's not. And and secondarily, if your gut is telling you something, uh, a, de- a poor decision or potentially poor decision is better than no decision at all. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you, and then you work from yeah. there. I think I think that's quite an interesting thing. Uh, uh, you know, a decision or not. Um, you know, indeci- decision or indecision. Uh, the, 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 there's a couple of good good good. Um, you know, I've got a couple of good sort of. They're, they're maritime, but so humour me for a second. So I think in that situation, so, would you agree that sometimes making a decision? gives you um, a bit of initiative. Yes. You, you make a decision and then there's, and then, and so something happens. So the most important thing having made a decision is that an action takes place. Yep. You know, people do a lot of, an awful lot of planning, but planning is pointless unless you execute the plan. So you make it, you make your plan you then decide to execute it, and then you execute it. You do something. And as soon as you've done something, you then have to observe if what you've done is, first of all, what you expected or what you intended, <laughs> or, or if you don't know what you were expecting or intending, you know, well, what's happened and what shall I do now? Do you see what I mean? So and a decision then, if it's the wrong decision, well, that'll – provoke another plan perhaps uh, an alternative to it, it but but somehow you've got some control if you don't make a decision hmm what happens then I, now, I, can't, recently, yeah. I mean I, I do a lot of I do a lot of yacht racing uh, and it's a very and, uh, and it's a very in or dinghy racing you know in sailing boats it's a really interesting uh, uh, comparison. Because um, it's about there's a, there's a bit of psychology here. So you've got two boats that are broadly going at similar speeds. So, you know, let's say they're, they're pretty much identical. So it's, it's you against the other guy. Now, a bit like tennis, it doesn't matter um, where you place the ball on the tennis court. Are you going to make him run, or are you going to uh, you going to try? You know, do you know his backhand's not very good? You know, what is it that you've worked out? Is he is he is he carrying a bit of a, a limp? You know, what is it? Well, in a boat, um, do I tack now? Uh, do I cross his bow? Do I put him under pressure? Do I do something he did he, he's not expecting? You know, how do I gain an advantage? How do I put him off? Because that's what I'm trying to do. Because I'm trying to win. So in a race, you're trying to win. In the situation we were in there, were we trying to win? Hmm. We were. Well, first of all, we were trying to survive. But ultimately, yeah, we were trying to win. We just didn't quite know who the enemy was, or or who the opposition were, or or who had all the cards. So we had to try things to 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 try to work out what the boundaries were and what the what cards the other guy had. In that case, the other guy had an awful lot of water and some holes in the side of our ship. Do you see what I mean? It's quite interesting sort of business about deciding or not deciding. And in a race I was in the other day, we were crossing. We had the we did we did we have the we we were going to cross about. Uh, you know, a, a matter of a few feet ahead of the other boat. Now, uh, if we crossed and then uh, and we were on different tacks, so if we crossed and then and then turned to go the same way as him, would we have given him? Would we have made his situation better or worse? Or should we go before we reached him? Should we cross him? Should we should we let him go ahead of us? Sure, what should we do? And uh, once or twice we made a decision, and a couple of times we didn't make a decision and we decided to wait and actually about half the time deciding to wait was the right answer you know because why because the circumstances changed the wind changed direction a bit was a bit less tied a bit further on whatever it was you know actually we suddenly found ourselves by not making a decision we found ourselves in a better place but in a way martin we made a decision not to make a decision yeah yeah i agree and that was an interesting thing in itself 
and I can remember it was only last weekend we were well, the weekend before last when uh, we were we were racing, and we and in two two with the same boat two twice we crossed with them we beat them in the end you'll be glad to know. <laughs> it's um, done. On the first time we decided to tack early, and we said, "Oh, good decision to tack early," you know, pleased with ourselves. And on the second time we dithered. And I wanted to go, and my friend who was driving said, uh, in fact, my daughter was driving, but my friend was our tech, is the tactician, the three of us in the boat. They decided not to, t- not to go, not to make a decision. And I was going, oh, I should have made a decision. But, of course, they did. They made a decision not to make a decision. Um, really interesting issues. Um, yeah. Well, I think you're right. We, we teach a lot of leadership principles here to, you know, in, in the – in the commercial sector, public sector, even mm. in, in the sporting world. And it, you're absolutely right. You know, if you're, if there is no decision made consciously, um, then it never leads to actions, which never leads to outcomes. You, you're just procrastinated in no man's land. You're at the mercy of the elements. Mm. Whereas when you make a diff- decision, good, bad, or indifferent, um, that instantly leads to actions which will drive some form of outcomes. And if it's a good outcome, great, we keep going. If it's not, we'll learn from that outcome and make another one. But we sort of have this overarching saying, which is the reason decisions are important, good, bad, or indifferent, is because there is nothing more powerful than a decided mind in psychology because it instantly thrusts you into into a series of actions and outcomes. And mm. I, I think that that's, if you don't mind me saying, sir, that's what you did remarkably well on that evening. You know, you made calls, decisions. And, you know, when you looked over the uh, over mm. the, the side of the ship and you think, shit, I've got this one wrong and we're all about to go swimming. Mm. I, can, I can imagine that your relief... 15, 20 seconds later when that wasn't going to be the case. When I wasn't, when I wasn't any wetter. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh, an interesting link into that, though, Richard. You don't probably remember this, but you maybe do. So I, I got deployed from the uh, the dining hall to go to, to down to the compartment. And um, the instruction from the buffer, I think, was you have to go and have your life jackets on you in case. You know, we need life jackets on uh, or around our waist, ready to deploy. Mm. And uh, I said, there's no time for that. And I, because uh, mine was in echo mess, probably right. swimming, swimming at this point, <laughs> right? Inflated by then, yeah. Yeah, yeah inflated, <laughs> right? So I said, there's no time for that. Uh, and I went straight down. And then about three hours into it, once we started to realize that actually we might have a chance and get on top of this stuff, I think he must have told you because you popped your head in and went, Johnson, go and get a life jacket. He said, at least you said, at least have one round your waist or something. And I, mm-hmm. I, I, so I, in the end, I went, no, no problem, sir. And then you, you, you went on to the next compartment and I carried on anyway. You know, it was like, but it was the last thing on my mind to go run and get my life jacket. There was no time, you know, it was like, let's go. But um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. So in all of that, I think decisions are so important. And, I, and it's an interesting observation you made, you know, decisions lead to actions. And sometimes your decision not to make a decision is a good one, right? As long as it's conscious and as long as you've followed that thought process, it's where you're just rabbit in the headlights, unsure, in a state of panic. Yeah. Uh, that that's not the place to be no. in, in any leadership position, is it? It, it, it must be a bit. It, I've never been. A, I've never been a very good chess player, but I think there's quite a good analogy there as well. Um, if I do this, then what happens next? You know, what are the, what's the, uh, you've, you, uh, and, and, and sometimes that decision not to do something means, okay, well, I know that the things are going to continue as they are then, or I know I'm, I'm, I'm not made a decision because I can see how it's going to unfold. And I think that I can make a better decision when it's unfolded a bit further. But sometimes if you don't quite know how it's going to unfold, maybe that's the time to make a decision. Maybe because you want to force the action in a certain direction. And certainly with coming off the rock, that's what I wanted to do, was force the action in a certain direction. Because I knew that staying there was going to, the situation was going to get worse. So I had to find some way of breaking that cycle of, uh, of, of trying, to, trying in some form to grasp the initiative. Uh, away from uh, the elements which had um, which had put us put us in that situation, I needed to I needed to take 
to to try and put things back in our court. Of course, the 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 impl- the, the the result of, of of that decision was that as we moved forwards, more water came in more quickly. Um, for a while, we thought about just going everywhere backwards to try and uh, stop to see if the water would come in more slowly. But we did. We we eventually found the right kind of speed, which was very slow. Um, and uh, um, but as soon as we started to come ahead, I remember the, the engineer shouting at me, "Hey, you're pushing more water in." Okay, I won't do that then. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but you know. But what was interesting, Martin, is having made that decision, uh, and I then told the sort of leadership team what that decision was and what I was going to do, they then focused their efforts on informing that decision. Do you see what I mean? So they didn't just react to it. They also provided useful supporting information to because they knew what the plan was so i think there's a key f- feature here which is that the you've got your 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 team whether it's just the two of you in the in deciding to use bedding in the in the in your in your compartment or or the command team trying to work out you know what were we going to do where were we going to do where were we going to take the ship and 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 what were the priorities the the the, the Right, we've got off the rock. Plan A is um, is we'll we'll look for somewhere to beach the thing so that if we can't stop the water coming in, at least we won't submerge beneath the waves. Right, okay. And then the team, then the guys around me, the guys, uh, the other sort of heads of department and, uh, and engineers and uh, and people, uh, you know, leading teams trying to stop water coming in all fed information into the process so that we knew okay well we think now that it would be at least two hours before we sink okay well that gives us two hours to find somewhere better to put the ship and there's the two hours then turned into three hours we thought okay well let's not ground it straight away let's let's find somewhere where we can anchor where the water's deep enough to anchor, but shallow enough so that if it does all go bad, we we don't disappear beneath the waves. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> so information then, the, the team then turn their efforts to, first of all, um, their, their primary jobs, but secondly, informing the command decision and the command aim on what it was we were trying to do boss needs to know this doesn't need to know that right tell him this do you see what i mean so that was quite an interesting sort of piece of how the team works together you know uh and 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 so over the next few hours we got a better understanding of 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 the of the extent of the damage and our ability to control it uh, and we knew, you know, so that's why you were then deployed into that into that compartment to uh, to contain the water. You weren't going to pump the water out of the forward engine room, but you were going to stop it from spreading any further because we knew that that was that was the, the sensible thing to do. It took us a bit of time to work that out, but probably, you know, um, once we knew what the plan was, then everybody could adjust to it. Yeah. So I'm going to now uh, take you back from this whole incident, uh, and I'm going to. This is something you may not have thought about, Richard, but um, I meant what I said uh, around you were definitely the best skipper I ever had, and one of the best leaders I've ever served for. And let me tell you why, because um, I have this saying in leadership where I think great leaders they build up their credits with their teams and their people and it allows them and earns them the right to command when the moment's needed and if i rewind into you know before the incident through the whole deployment through the ship's refit through the previous you know um Mm. deployments uh, i think you was a skipper who was uh incredibly in touch right down to my level you know um you Mm. from the minute i joined the ship for example you um 
you came to support the rugby. I played rugby and you came to support the rugby. And I think early doors, our PTI at the time was not really a rugby guy. And he sort of was looking for somebody to take the rugby team on. And I think you said, Johnson, this deployment, you're going to run the rugby team. And I was thinking, I'm 19. These guys are 40, 30. How am I? Mm. And you said, if you're good enough, you're old enough. You know, and it was like, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, so you showed an interest there. I'll also mention as well, and be honest, and I don't know if you remember, but I, I liked I liked a good run ashore. And I think mm. I, I was in trouble one or two times for being adrift and being pissed and uh, getting myself into some bother. And I think I, I, I saw myself arrive at your table a couple of times. Mm. Um, and when the door was shut and people left, I think you were sort of looking at me as in, Come on, Johnson! Don't put me in this position. You know you're a good rugby player. You're a good lad. Don't don't spoil don't spoil yourself. But you always seem to uh, deal with it appropriately and give me the benefit of the doubt. And and what I'm saying is, for me personally, then, uh, and I even remember a time, Richard, where we had we had some activities going up in the middle of a beautiful day in the uh, Pacific Ocean, and we had uh, we had some games on the on the on the uh, flight deck, and you came down, and we had this. The greasy pole set up with a swimming pool underneath it and um we we, we played duel and it, we had these big pillars full of stuff and we had to knock your opponent off the pole into the water yeah. and i think you arrived on the flight deck and i was about 12 people undefeated uh no you know i was like literally winner stays on and i, I i'm i'm bashing all these people off on, on duel and Someone says, come on then, Skipper, are you getting up? And you said, yeah, no problem. I, 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 and I'm thinking, I can't really hit the Skipper as hard as this, surely not. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you remember, but you got on versus me. And you said, don't hold back, Johnson. And I thought, right, you're having it. And I, and I hit you with this thing. And yet we had a good little to do and you fell into the pool and everybody yeah. cheered. But that was you. I think you yeah. never really uh, separated. You, you, you walked the floors. You engaged yeah. your people. You gave me the benefit of the doubt. So... What I'm saying is I think you earned your credits up from the runner shores, from the engagement. So when that time hit, whatever you needed doing, whatever the command was, whatever the situation was, I think people were rooting for you and people were uh, going above and beyond. And I, and I think there's something to be said for that. It wasn't just about the evening. It was about the culture we had on that ship, the camaraderie we had. I agree. I think, driven I think, from you. I, 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 I completely agree. I think... Um, I think I learned that um, uh, as a, as a, throughout my career, really. Um, I think that to be a leader, you've got to, well, the, the first thing is you've got to walk the patch. You know, uh, if, if some ships, some places, the, the senior management stay in their office, stay in their cabin. That doesn't work. That's not what it's about. The only way I think that I've ever done this has been to get out and about. And you never find me in my cabin um, unless I was going to sleep or having a meeting in there, really. you know. Um, the rest of the time, I'd be wandering around the ship talking to people. And I think there's a couple of elements of that. Um, you as a leader need to know your people but almost as importantly, and perhaps more importantly, they need to know you. And I think that's a that's such an important. You've got to. Uh, there are there are there are many ways of doing this, but my approach has always been to open myself up a bit. I'm not. I don't, I've got nothing particular to hide. You know. I. You know. If you're if you're curious come poking and, and you'll find out about me, you know. Um, I'm naturally curious, so I'm going to come poking and find out a bit about you. Um, the more we know each other, the more we know what our strengths and weaknesses are. You know, the guy I know the guys I can trust. You know, I know the guys who are going to go the extra yard, the guys who are going to, who, you know, everybody's got something to offer, Martin. Um, you know, it's not necessarily their day job. Some people may have other skills that, or other attributes that um, that are that are so useful, um, and you're only going to find those out through human interaction. So, you know, the the current situation where there's a lot of working from home, it's quite difficult, I think. Um, to to 
maintain that kind of uh, leadership ethos that, that, that certainly the military uh, enjoys. And the military is, is a very privileged society in that respect. Don't forget, it's volunteers. It's people who, you know, who are basically wired up much the same way. Um, you've got to be slightly odd if you want to go to sea for a living. Well, therefore, we're all much, you know, we all decided we were going to go to sea for a living. So the 230, 50 people on that ship were all pointing in roughly the same direction um, the day they walked through the door at, uh, at, the, at the recruiting centre. Do you know what I mean? So we were very blessed in that respect that, you know, you're surrounded by, you know, like-minded um, uh, consenting adults um uh, 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 and, and that's a that's a great privilege but but you have to use it wisely so for me you know um it's a quite an interesting thing that whole business of you know being about i remember that you know the flight deck sports day and uh, i think was it well we might have been doing we might have been a crossing the line ceremony or something like that i remember yeah. you know, not that whole <laughs> no, the other the other competition uh, was Nottingham's strongest man. <laughs> I, I'd like to remind you that I won that. You did. Uh, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so, but um, but <laughs> uh, I remember that more vividly than being knocked off uh, the pole by some upstart bloody rugby player. But, <laughs> uh, but it was such a laugh. But it's a really interesting thing because. You, you, ha you have to open up to people and let them in, I think. But you can also go too far. Uh, and if you're, t and, 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 uh, and, and the mistake that sometimes is made, and perhaps it's more of a military thing than, a, than, a, than, than, in, the, than in the commercial world, I don't really know. But it can be useful if there's some sort of level of separation. And I don't quite understand what, what that is and at what point it becomes important. In a tiny uh, company with you know, four or five people, um, you don't, there's no, I don't think there are any secrets. I don't think there's any separation between you. I think you're all in there together. In a company of, 200 in a warship with 200 you know there was Abel Seaman Johnson and there was Commander Farrington and we knew each other and uh, and uh, we would have a laugh together and if we met in the in the in a, in a pub ashore uh, there was a reasonable chance that we'd, we'd have a drink together um, but there was always a, and uh, you know um, but you would never have um, you would probably never have called me Richard. I might have called you Martin, but on board the ship I wouldn't have done because on board the ship you were Abel Seaman Johnson and you had status and credibility and that was a rank that you had earned. Um, and that's something very important to recognise. You're, you're, you know, you know, a junior lad, but nonetheless you have responsibilities and you had training and you had skills that I didn't have. You were better at firing that gun than I was, uh, and therefore I needed to use. You needed to. I recognised that and appreciated you for that. You know, the same would be true of a chef or a, or a, or a, or a stoker. You know, they could do things that the rest of us couldn't do. We all had our roles to play. But that whole business of leadership, uh, I think, is a fascinating balance between uh, trust and professional competence uh, and, um, and the ability to communicate. Perhaps the most important uh, skill of the lot, don't you think? Communication? For sure, yeah. And, and even when I found myself at your table a couple of times on that deployment for mm. my, minor misdemeanors in, in my yeah. eyes, but again, I brought the rules, uh, I, I, you always maintained that whether we would talked about rugby, whether we'd had shared a pint in a run ashore, whether you had a, whether you saw something in me and was rooting for me, which you clearly was, but you always, I arrived at your table, the charge was read out, 
you'd look at me with those eyes as in, don't put me in this position, but mm. you'd treat me no different to anybody else. And if I got a week's nines on the ship and I missed Singapore, the, so be it. That was the consequence of, yeah. of, of an action. And then what you was also very good at, however, though, is once that time had been served and once you'd repaid, oh. it was clean slate. Uh, mm. It was clean slate and we go again. And I think that was always a really uh, a good aspect of it as well. I learned that from my father, I think. Um, my mother used to bear a grudge, bless her. Um, she was a very uh, strong-willed uh, person, and um, and uh, she'd never let you forget any little error you'd made. Mm. I learned from that, and I learned that, um, yep, we all make mistakes, right, uh, move on. <laughs> you know, uh, and it was very important, uh, yeah, Every organisation, every ship, every every commercial organisation has characters, you know, uh, and you want characters. God forbid it's a sausage machine. You want people who are going to be individuals. And and sometimes, yeah, sometimes that meant that uh, you you overextended on a, on a run ashore and had too many beers and were and um, or, or whatever. Well, okay. Um, Pay the, this is the uh, B, you have to be absolutely straight. You can't show favoritism, but you can encourage. Uh, and that's that's an important distinction, I think. And so uh, so for me, encouraging um, people to 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 to, you know, to proceed where they're doing well is the most important thing. Yeah, and you were quite a good rugby player, so we encouraged you to do that, and and that then brought dividends in other areas, uh, because your confidence there and your confidence, you know, uh, then uh, allowed you to develop your professional skills in other areas, and your and your and your ability as a team player, not just on the rugby field, but in in on the night of that incident in the after engine room or, or and wherever else we employed you. Do you know what I mean? All these things fit together. So encouragement is a critical piece of the whole di and, and discipline for me. You know, a lot of people talk about oh, the armed forces awfully disciplined. No, 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 it's not really this. It is discipline. But what it is uh, fundamentally is a set of rules about how to live together in a very confined, very um, concentrated environment. So that discipline involves everything from how you fold up your kit to put it into the world's smallest possible locker to the way in which you um, wear your uniform or the uh, way you march or, or whatever it happens to be. That's all. It's, it's not it's not there to, as, an, as a pain in the ass. It's there as a code of conduct, uh, which helps you to live cheek by jowl with your fellow man in a in an unfamiliar uh, uncomfortable environment uh, and still thrive that's all it's for is it yes so what happens when uh, when the ship's sinking and we say right uh, able sim johnson i want you to go down the after engine room uh in the full knowledge uh, that i might have been sending you down there and i might never have seen you again because we might the compartment might have flooded I remember that killick the the, uh, the the club swinger uh, who was in Spud Murphy. Spud Murphy, yeah. Also a ship's diver, uh, and uh, we were there was in, in um, down in uh, three Foxtrot mess underneath the ops room was the um, machinery conversion room, and it was full of water. But he knew we we thought we knew where the where the water was coming in. We were about to shut the hatch on it and abandon it. He volunteered. He said, I'm a ship's diver. Just let me get in there with my kit on. Put the lid on. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in there for for 20 minutes and I can and I can stop the water coming in. I stopped him. I wouldn't let him go. I wouldn't let him do it because I just thought that that was going to the risk of losing him and drowning him was too high. And it wasn't, it was not essential. But he was prepared to do that. Uh, he had the confidence. He had the skill. He thought he had the skills. I'm sure he had the skills. Um, and he was certainly not short of bravery. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't necessary. Uh, I think he wasn't disappointed when I told him uh, that he wasn't going to do it. 
Um, but but it inspired the people around him um, in an extraordinary sort of uh, amount of effort. Then went in to 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 all to all the related activity around that compartment. You know, just from that man's that man's gesture to 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 potential self sacrifice to his for his fellow men and his ship. Extraordinary thing. So, um, so you, you just something on that, Richard, because it's 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 really apt. Is in the absence of rules and structure and some guidelines for a group of people, in the absence of that, there is chaos. Mm. And in the work of chaos, there is never no roads lead to productivity or performance. So, so I, what you sort of say in there is the, what the military get right is they have a code of conduct, a set of rules, a governance structure, some non-negotiables that everybody buys into. And because of that, we can operate in a, in a sort of environment of order or relative order. Yes. While still while still being able to organise and flex and move ourselves accordingly, and I think therein mm. lies the balance, doesn't it? That's what yeah. you can work with. And if organisations or any teams can have uh, some some non negotiable order that everybody buys into, yeah. and you leave you can leave room to be agile and flex and move. Absolutely, that's the yeah. sweet spot, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. It is. It is. And and uh, yeah. Because those rules are, um, they're there for a good reason. Uh, and I think you as the leader then have to, um, to judge uh, where some departure from those rules is, is, um, has value or not. Um, and, and back to the sort of, you know, boring bits of discipline. I think it was, you know, I wanted to make sure that on that deployment, people went and had uh, memorable adventures in foreign countries, you know. Um, and and so off you go. Um, so encouraging you to go out and have a good time was an important thing. But there was also a sort of an element of self self limitation, self control required. So um, you know, don't cross the line, uh, Abel Seaman Johnson. You know, you know where the line is. You know that I will enforce that line, um, and you know why it's there. And you sort of, you know, took your two days, nines or whatever it was and thought, oh, yeah, well, fair enough. You know, um, you know, very few people would be were, were, were ever particularly sort of felt they were seen off uh, by the <laughs> disciplinary process. Most people sort of understood why it was there and just get on and did it. I think I think the critical piece of that in translating that into a commercial setting, though, is the business about communication. It's about the, the command ethos, if you like, the leadership. What is the ethos of this company? What is the, what is, what do we stand for? What are we? Uh, what's important? Um, and, uh, and 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 what are the what are the rules? Um, you know, how does the game get played here? Uh, you know, you have and. and uh, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll, if, we, if we abide by those, then life goes well. On the rugby field, um, you know, uh, that's exactly the case. You, 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 and the guy you're playing against, you both know what the rules are, and you both know where the boundaries are. And uh, you know, if you're one of those extraordinary people in the front row of a scrum, you, um, you. Um, you spend your time right on the edge of those rules. It seems to me, um, uh, but you just don't get don't get fed up if you get caught out. You know, um, just work out how what the risk is. You know, risk risk management and rules and you know uh, are all critical, aren't they? They are. But they I think are. as a leader, it, it all does come back to communication, and therefore. You know, these are the rules, lads. Uh, these are the risks. These are the mission. This is the mission that we're trying to uh, to deliver. And so, therefore, um, this is what this is how we need to interpret those rules. Uh, and uh, and these are the skills that we have. And these are the tools that we have. Um, and this is the outcome that we see. So, if that means that we need to. You know, press the edge of those of that rule back rule box. Well, so be it. But if the communication is good, you can achieve anything. Absolutely, Richard. Seventy minutes down, and um, 
we could talk we all day. Started. We've only got started. We we could. I'll tell you what. If you're up for it, we could do in a in a quarter's time or whenever we can do a, a part two. We can come back and uh, if you like, yeah, no, I enjoyed I enjoy talking about this sort of thing. It's so interesting. Ah, it's been fascinating. It's been absolutely amazing for me to spend the time with you. It's been nice to relive mm. what we went through. It's been nice to talk and hear your philosophies and some of your some really key nuggets in there that I've taken away from it already. And I guess. Um, you know, th- th- that whole period of my life, certainly from joining the Navy at 16, mm. you know, years old to to leaving when I was in my early 20s. And, you know, the Nottingham period wasn't the, the most memorable. It wasn't all about that fateful night, that, that, that incident. I mean, we had a fantastic three-month journey on the way we visited. If you remember, we had Singapore, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, Australia, we'd, we'd done quite a, a oh, bit we of... Had, yeah, we had great adventures. But I always remember that. Though. There was a... Um, I think we'd just left Saigon. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was sat in a mess deck somewhere. Um, might have been yours. Uh, and um, and we were, the discussion was, where did we think the best run ashore was that we'd had? And the, the surprising answer was, lock you in scotland i remember yeah you remember maybe, crazy night maybe, and, and there was a very interesting reason for that we were on sea trials just coming out of refit and we were up in scotland doing some um sonar trials and it was an it was an, uh, an air defense destroyer so anti-submarine warfare was very very boring uh, by comparison with the sport of kings which was shooting down the enemy's airplanes um so we but we finished the, the sonar trials early we had to go to lock you for fuel and the fuel was the following morning but we worked out that we could get there the night before so off we went and this was very short notice uh and we called up lock you and said we're coming in this evening rather than tomorrow morning so hey, fine you know uh, so we pitched up at sort of um, six o'clock, a glorious or summer Scottish summer's evening, and I remember, you know, no tugs or anything, and we put the thing alongside, and the, just about the entire ship's company um, decamped into the local pub, and we had a lock-in, and we were there. So we, we'd been operating what about three or four months or something. It was before Christmas. Yeah, you know, I, I can't remember. It, was, it doesn't really matter. We, we, was, we, were, we were new as a ship's company. And this whole thing was completely unplanned, impromptu, and we ended up in that pub. And we were there till four in the morning or whatever. And um, and uh, and I'm you know, and and that's where relationships were forged that went on and delivered on that fateful night off Wolf off Wolf Rock two two and a half years later. I agree. I mm. think I returned to the ship in, on, in Scotland. I think I returned to the ship after that evening with slightly less clothing than I turned <laughs> up in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was extraordinary. Uh, yeah. And for most of us, and, and that's where we formed those lifelong friendships uh, acro- through, across the ship's company. Um, and the whole thing was completely unplanned. Yeah, they're the best yeah, ones. No, we made it up as we went along. There was a, clearly, obviously, there was a plan, but <laughs> there was an original plan, and we literally made it up as we went along. And I remember the following day feeling a bit shabby. Um, fortunately, somebody else was involved with the fueling, and uh, you know, and I, we never, th- I never thought though that all those, you know, all those months later, after the most extraordinary experiences in places like you know Bangkok and Saigon. You know, so lads, where was your best run ashore? Oh, lock you, sir. <laughs> oh, it was brilliant. It was it's, brilliant. And it's not, that's not just sailors' humour. That was about people, wasn't it? It was all about people. Um, the key but, it, was, but it was about it was about people from yourself, from the senior command down to myself. Yeah. It was about everybody doing the same thing. Yes. Engaging in the sa- on the yes. same level, yes. humanizing yourself, yes. being as one. They didn't yeah. feel like there was tiers and hierarchy yeah. and differences, yeah. and you know, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was amazing, amazing times. Yeah. I think a psychologist would have had a field there. Ah, oh, too right, too right. 
Richard, absolutely brilliant. Um, I Again, I, I'm definitely going to twist your arm to come back for a part two and we'll talk about more things and we'll hatch a plan. I'm immediate, I'm going to immediately look at my diary for the 7th of May and if I can make it across to Liverpool, I certainly will. And uh, I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop you a message if I do. On the Friday as well, I think. I think I'm going up on the Friday. So, uh, so Snags Murrell's got a plan to, uh, there's, a f- there's a few lads meeting in the pub on the Friday. So if you're uh, if you're even get involved on you might be able to make the Friday or the Saturday. Uh, absolutely. The, the, so the events in yeah, it's Saturday afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm terrified actually. I think my my alcohol capacity these days is remarkably diminished from what it was in those days. <laughs> oh, well, brilliant! I'm sure that won't make a difference when you're there on the night. You'll pay for it for sure. <laughs> Anyway, Richard, uh, I'll just sign this off by saying thank you for your time. It's been a wonderful uh, hour and 20 minutes there for me. Uh, I meant what I said. You are still uh, one of the best leaders I've uh, served under. I remember the time fondly. You was more than fair with me, uh, encouraged me. uh, Part of the jigsaw piece in my career where I've gone on to do what I've done and there's a couple of other people in the military that I could probably also add into the mix. Mm. And uh, it's just wonderful to connect with you 20 yeah. years on. And um, I'm sure our listeners will enjoy this podcast and take some stuff away from it. But for now, Richard uh, Farrington, CBE, thank you very much. Thank and, you, um, for the uh, opportunity to have a good old chin wag. Enjoyed it very much. Yep, yeah, you're welcome, sir. And um, we'll leave it there. And we'll be back shortly with another T2 Hubcast.